Thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm Alex Bainbridge from GreenNeft. I'm here today with um, Sam Walripa Watson. Um, obviously at the beginning we'll acknowledge that we're recording this video on stolen Aboriginal land. And in fact we're going to be talking about Aboriginal issues today and there are um, there are obviously many issues that we can um, that we can be talking about, but the, the Labor government has foisted this voice referendum onto us. Um, so today we're going to address that, and obviously I'm sure other things will come up as well. Um, I'm guessing a lot of people watching this video will already have a sort of a critical position about the voice anyway. But um, I wonder maybe if we could just start, Sam, um, if you if you could just. <laughs> I guess explain to us why it might why some people might have a critical attitude towards the voice in general. Like what like some people are, some people are obviously presenting this as like oh the best thing since sliced bread or at the very least it's a step forward. Um, why might why might you know progressive people be be critical of the voice? Well, there's a lot of reasons that people might be critical of the voice. Uh, firstly, like the way that you phrased it is perfect. It's been thrust on us. Um, when the Uluru conference was happening, where the statement from the heart was developed and, and certain members of the community were consulted, um, there wasn't even a clear idea of what the Uluru statement was. Participants were asked to sign a blank document. Um, so, you know, this is something that we haven't asked for. Uh, and yeah, so it's being thrust on us. Um, and, you know, it's really disturbing the way that Labor is framing this as, um, you know, a chance for non-Indigenous Australians to, uh, you know, stand with Aboriginal people by voting for this voice when Aboriginal people have never asked for the voice. And, you know, all the voice actually is, uh, is an advisory body to parliament and Aboriginal people have never asked for that. Um, you know, in fact, we've had, we've had similar iterations in the past, um, with the, um, NIAA and ATSIC, um, and those advisory bodies were also heavily criticized for being ineffective and, um, you know, bureaucratic. Um, yeah, so I guess I guess that there's there's a couple of reasons there. Um, you know, the other reasons are that you know some people believe that the voice could pose a threat to sovereignty. Um, you know, in a in a legal framework. Um, yeah, and I I, I guess th there's a lot of reasons, but um, the big ones for me is that it's been thrust upon us and we, we haven't asked for it and it will be, uh, you know, useless. And um, all I really see it as is a distraction from the Labor government, you know. It's where in the, where, you know, the amount of things that the Labor government has done to Aboriginal people um, is you know astonishing and now they i think just want to use a voice to make themselves look good i think it's the same as kevin rudd's uh, apology to the stolen generations um you know it's it's something that effectively does nothing um but makes the government look really good actually talking about the labor party i, I mean i guess one of the things i feel like you had like the Hawke government originally was promising land rights and then that all disappeared into a puff of smoke. Then you had the High Court um, bring in the, um, the the Mabo decision, but Keating's Native Title Act actually, I mean, the Mabo decision itself was quite limited, but Keating's Native Title Act actually restricted Aboriginal rights further. Um, but Keating will do a nice, you know, Redfern speech and uh, <laughs> and sort of create this sort of nice impression. Kevin Rudd does the same thing, like, you know, he comes in and makes a nice speech and creates a nice impression, but very emphatically no compensation. Um, and and then the actual problem that he apologised for has been getting, getting worse. Stolen children are now worse than it, was, than it was before Kevin Rudd's apology. And now, I mean, here's Albo, yeah, basically it's sort of a symbolic action, but what's the substance? Yeah, and, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised that a lot of left-wing people, uh, you know, are very critical of The Voice because 
the left have a long memory. Um, you know, there, there are people who remember that when the Mabo decision was made, the Native Title Act limited land rights even more. There are people who remember the NIAA and ATSIC and how bureaucratic and ineffective and even corrupt they were. Um, and, you know, there are people who remember that Kevin Rudd said, sorry, and then also said, we'll never pay you compensation. Um, so, you know, in a way, like, I think that any time that Labor does something, even, you know, the, the smallest act from Labor, it's like, I just wait for the other shoe to drop, you know? Um, another example is that Labor um, politicians are now looking at a Cultural Heritage Act and Cultural Heritage uh, legislation, um, but it's it's a Queensland Labor government that extinguished the native title rights of Gwangan and Jagalinga people for the Adani mine. Um, you know, so apart from all the, the things wrong with the voice, I guess I'm also waiting for the other shoe to drop and to find out, you know, really just how limited it is or really just how far it sets us back. I mean, the other thing is one might expect that after the voice has been resolved one way or the other, um, Labor might well say, okay, well, tick, Aboriginal rights done. And then what, yeah. what next? I mean, what, yeah, what, what would you say about that? I'd say that's, uh, that's also, you know, a potential for, um, you know, ordinary people in this country is that they vote yes for the voice and, you know, it gets through and they say, okay, well, you know, now we've helped Aboriginal people. Or it doesn't get through and they say, oh, well, at least we tried. Um, but yes, I think that, um, you know, if it doesn't get through, people are going to have to face the fact that Australia is a very racist country. Because if the voice does not get through, it's not going to be because of the uh, progressive no vote or the left wing no vote. Um, it will be, you know, um, that'll be done by by the right wing of politics in this country um you know the people who think that the voice is actually a radical thing and will give aboriginal people some power mm. and you know people who want to stop that well i mean let's get on to that because my understanding is you are calling for a no vote i mean do you want to explain because some people will find that surprising so do you want to explain why that is yeah i i, th I think that you know uh Left-wing people should be voting no, um, you know, on principle. I don't think that that any of us support it. I think that right now there's two camps. There's a critical yes and there's a progressive no in the left. Um, and, you know, some people saying that they're going to abstain and not vote or, um, you know, donkey vote. But I think that the left on principle should vote no because we don't support this. We don't support a powerless body of bureaucrats, you know, whether they're black or not, um, you know, giving their opinion to parliament and then parliament, you know, doesn't have to do anything about that. They can, they can, you know, tick the box and say, yes, we've listened, we've consulted Aboriginal people. Um, you know, I've heard the arguments that we can't allow the right to win um, and the left is not strong enough to actually have an impactful uh, no vote. But I think if the, if the left isn't actually strong enough to have an impactful no vote, uh, then in what way are we helping the right? If we actually make so little impact that no one will like remember that we voted no, then are we really helping the right? you know, win this, win this election, um, win this referendum. And I think that it's important to say that we support Aboriginal rights and we support sovereignty and self-determination, but that doesn't mean voting yes for this voice. What it actually means is land rights and community controlled organisations 
and reparations. Um, and, you know, I think that, yeah, this, this, the voice isn't going to deliver on any of those things. And taking, taking this away from um, the right, if the right um, no campaign wins this referendum, taking that, taking that win away from them isn't going to bring us any closer to those things. Um, and, you know, in a, in a legal sense, like, there's a lot of people who think that uh, the voice, you know, poses threats to sovereignty. Um, so, yeah, why would we support it? I think the left on principle um, should vote this down. To be honest, I, I find it hard to see how this is going to affect sovereignty one way or the other. Um, I'd be curious to know if you, yeah, if you, you know, what, like, why, why, what, how do you see this as a threat to sovereignty? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I tend to agree that sovereignty isn't just uh, a a legal framework; it's a material framework, um, and you know, sovereignty, sovereignty. The the Uluru statement from the heart called sovereignty a spiritual notion that exists. Uh, um, coexists with the sovereignty of the crown, um, and I, I, I completely, I completely disagree with that. Sovereignty is a material condition. It's it's the ability to control what happens, uh, you know, to your people on your on your land, um, and there's there's no law that can ever be written that that will take away aboriginal sovereignty in that sense um and you know when we when we fight for sovereignty and self-determination it's not just a a legal acknowledgement of it it's the material condition that we're fighting for um so you know i guess in a sense like as as a as a revolutionary i don't think that anything can ever take that away um but the the things that come after um, the voice to parliament are the Makarata Commission, the Makarata Commission, um, which is a commission to oversee truth telling for the purposes of treaties. Um, I think that um, the pathway to treaties um, framework is already dodgy enough and has a lot of the same problems with the voice where people are being excluded and um you know it's very bureaucratic but i also know that the voice will be making recommendations on treaty processes and the people who sit on the advisory body will not be from the country that those recommendations are being made for so I think, you know, when, when you have figures like Noel Pearson or um, Malandira McCarthy or Linda Burney, um, you know, standing up and saying that the voice is something that all Aboriginal people want, I can see them, uh, you know, those types of black bureaucrats um, making the same kinds of blanket statements in the Makarata Commission or in the Voice to Parliament, um, you know, making recommendations uh, with these treaties um, that don't actually represent the people who um, are parties to the treaties. And I think that that's, that's, that's one way, that's probably the biggest way that it, it threatens Aboriginal sovereignty. On this sort of claim about 80% of Aboriginal people uh, support the voice, I mean, that's the claim that's often made. Uh, how would you respond to that? I think, I think that it's, it's way too simple um, to just say 80% of Aboriginal people support the voice. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who um, don't actually understand the voice and we've seen this happen where in the No campaign there's a group called Advance Australia and they put up a photo of an artist who they claimed was Vincent Lingari's um, you know, relative and that person not only did they not support the No campaign and um, they were not Vincent Lingari's uh, relative, they didn't actually understand what the voice to, par to parliament um, was. And this, this is a problem where the government hasn't actually done effective 
community consultation. So, you know, there's that, there's that factor where a lot of people who aren't in metropolitan areas, I would say, you know, don't actually have that much info about the voice. Um, and then there's also a lot of people who would be in a critical yes um, position where they don't actually believe that the voice to parliament is going to do anything and they don't believe that the voice to parliament, um, you know, even if it, even if it did function the way that Labor's talking about, you know, would actually have real power, um, but just don't want to vote with the likes of Peter Dutton and Barnaby Joyce. You said earlier that you thought that if the, if the no campaign won, um, that would be seen as a racist, um, you know, a racist um, comment or like, a, or like a proof, of, proof of racism in the Australian community. Even if, even if the progressive no is small, if it's enough to tip the balance between yes and no, aren't you worried that there would be a, that that, that interpretation will basically re reinforce negative attitudes and basically, I guess, you know, in some level, make it difficult to mobilise, make, make, make it harder to mobilise for anti-racist campaigns? Well, I truly think that racists are beaten when they're chased off the streets and don't come back, not you know, when they're um, beaten at the ballot box. Um, you know, Pauline Hanson um, was beat when she was counter-protested everywhere she went to speak. Um, you know, Posey Parker, the um, horrible transphobe who came to um, Australia a few months ago, um, she was beat when she was chased out of Melbourne and when she was chased out of uh, Hobart. Um, Reclaim Australia, that movement was beaten when it was chased off the streets by anti-racists. So I think when we um, are talking about how to challenge racism and we ask that question of how do we challenge racism, that's how we do it. We, we stop those racists from being able to mobilise. Um, you know, I also think that the way that it's polling at the moment um, you know, I think I think that I think that Albanese has really brought this on, and I don't want to blame uh, people who are in the progressive no camp for racists being emboldened. That that blame should be squarely at Labor's feet. They've brought on this referendum. Um, that Aboriginal people never asked for. And even if now we support, you know, support it because we're, it's being forced on us, um, you know, we never asked for it. And of course, racists, we're gonna be, we're gonna be, you know, encouraged to, to come out of the woodwork and spread all their racist ideas by this, of course. And labor, labor is partly to blame for some of those racists that exist. You know, it's, it's labor governments who, continued the anti-intervention. It's Labor governments who locked up refugees for 10 years. It's Labor governments who lock up children at 10 years old uh, in prisons. Um, so, you know, if, if, if we're looking for people to blame for the result of this referendum, it should be Labor. It should not be Aboriginal activists. To move to a more positive, like, what, you know, people that care about First Nations rights, Aboriginal rights, what should we be campaigning for? What are the things that we should be, what other things that Aboriginal people do want? Our demands over the last 50 years have been pretty consistent. It's been for self-determination, land rights, community control and reparations. What we're asking for is not unachievable. Um, what we're asking for is control of our own country, control of our own community and control of our own futures. Um, and at the moment that has been stolen from us. All we want is to have it back and we're going to keep on fighting for that. And we're not going to fight for anything less. You know, we're not going to settle until we have that. Um, the great thing is, is that, is that all of those things are actually in line with the interests of the working class. Um, you know, when we want our land back, we want our land back to stop mining and environmental destruction happen on it. That's something that benefits 
all working class people. Um, you know, when we talk about um, community control, um, we're talking about things like education and health and legal services. Um, and those services uh, benefit working class Aboriginal people more than anyone else, but also can benefit working class communities. Um, you know, Australia since 230 years ago has been due for a reckoning. Um, and that reckoning is against the people who've stolen our lands and stolen our futures and stolen our, our control of our own destiny. Um, so, you know, that reckoning is going to come one day. Um, and really for, uh, for non-Indigenous Australians, the biggest question that they have to answer is where they're going to stand when that reckoning comes. Are they going to stand with Aboriginal people who want justice? Or are they going to stand with the colonial capitalist oppressors that also oppress them? Um, you know, I think the answer is pretty obvious. The other day when we were talking... Um you actually were expressing views that were sort of fairly critical about treaty. And I think like a lot of, a lot of Aboriginal people have been actually sort of contrasting treaty as the, as the better alternative than the voice. Maybe do you want, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. I don't think the treaty is going to be the solution to our problems. I think that the solution to our problems um, comes from struggle and um, very clear, you know, control of our land, community and, you know, economy, um, everything, our, our, our own control of everything. Um, and I don't think that a treaty will ever achieve that. I don't think that there's ever going to be a treaty that says that Aboriginal people have the final say about what happens, uh, on their land. I don't think that's ever going to happen um, with a colonial government under capitalism. Mm. Um, and when you look at the rest of the world, um, where every other Indigenous people um, who've been colonised have treaties with uh, the uh, colonial state, um, you can see that they've all been violated right across um, North and South America, uh, right across Africa um, and in Asia, those treaties have been violated by the colonial governments. Usually, usually for uh, mining uh, fossil fuels and infrastructure. And that's the same things that uh, threaten our land here. And I don't think that there's anything unique about our situation in this country that means that our treaties won't be violated here. Um, so I think that truthfully, what, what, what we should do is cut to the chase and say we need to struggle um, as part of the working class, um, you know, against the people who want to mine our country and want to, um, you know, build a road over a sacred site. Um, and, you know, win that way. Mm. I think that that's the only way that we can ever truly um, have justice is to dismantle a system that's based on uh, profit accumulation and replace it with a system that's, you know, there for human need. Mm. In that sense, Aboriginal rights is connected with a broader yeah. radical social change project. Yeah. yeah. Anything else you want to say before we finish up? Yeah, there are already so many inspiring stories that we can draw from of solidarity between non-Indigenous workers and Aboriginal people. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the kind of most amazing stories that, I, that comes to mind is uh, between the solidarity between um, meat workers in the UK and the Gurindji people who are on strike against... Um, against uh, Oh, I forget. Lord Vesti. Um, you know, the Gurindji people were, were fighting for their land back um, against this cattle capitalist. Um, 
and in the meat shops where his uh, cattle was being sold as food, uh, the workers in those meat shops uh, sent money to the Gurindji people because they were struggling against the same person. They were both struggling against Lord Vesti and the, the struggles weren't exactly the same. You know, the, the workers in the UK um, struggling for better wages and conditions, um, you know, but they were supporting the Gurindji people who were struggling for land rights. Um, and, you know, really, really, when you think about it, um, the purpose of land rights and the purpose of better paying conditions is to have better control of your own, of your own life. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not, it's not, uh, some, some strange wild fantasy that I'm talking about when I'm talking about solidarity between the non-Indigenous working class and Aboriginal people who are struggling for justice. I'm not in a cynical um, mind frame when it comes to that. I'm, I'm quite cynical about the voice to parliament um, and Labor, but I don't think that there isn't solidarity between, um, yeah, the working class and Aboriginal people. That's a great way to finish. Cool.